space today. Can you do that? You can be seated. We have some special stuff to share with you, but before we do that, let's bring the kids up to Kids Club and we'll get you guys dismissed. Get to go to Kids Club. Maria, tell us what you're studying this month. Courage. Courage. Oh, that's a fantastic subject. going to make you into fierce Jesus lions, right? <laughs> let's pray for you guys. Lord, we lift up these boys and, and girls to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Touch them, encourage them, and help them to be more and more and more like Jesus. Increase their faith, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, before we get started today, I just want to uh, share with you a couple of announcements. We have had a monumental, massive scheduling explosion that we've never had in the history of South Bay Bible Church, and if I have anything to say about it, it will never happen again. <laughs> You've probably seen it on social media, but we are announcing it special. Michael Francesi was supposed to be here next weekend. And somewhere on the contract, a typo was placed. Uh, Scott Rigsby was here on May 19th, and they put October 19th, but it's not October 19th. And so he had an assistant that is no longer with him and so on, and anyway... He is scheduled somewhere else next Sunday. So he uh, helped us in getting things fixed, and he's going to be here the last weekend of October. You can imagine we are scrambling to get everybody notified because we feel terrible. This is, uh, like I said, never happened before, but be patient with us, and, and it wasn't uh, really our mistake. We looked through the email threads and all of that, and the date was scheduled and confirmed by email properly, but somewhere in that translation, things got messed up. So um, be patient with us. We'll get that fixed. New posters are going up. New invite cards will be out there next Sunday. New posters will be out there next Sunday, and uh, pray that nothing like this happens again, and pray for your pastor's heart so that, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, <laughs> that is just crazy, oh, when I got that news last week, I was just like, what, <laughs> oh my goodness, but I have some good news, so we're not going to start the sermon on, on a bad note, we have a, another announcement to share with you that's incredible, we had a miracle last night, that's not the miracle slide, oh, I'll let you put it on there. So we had a miracle last night. We had a Sunday night, a Saturday night service, and we have a special, you know, they, 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 Ellen is there, and so there's always a spread of food. And after that, um, uh, Danielle, uh, I don't know, many of you probably know Danielle, and, and she helps Ezra. He's a little boy that she, he count, she counsels and helps. And so Ezra and um, Kayla, his mom, Danielle went across the street first, and Ezra kind of walked slowly, and Kayla was behind them, but a car was going so fast down the road, and uh, Ezra lingered, and Kayla saw it, his mom, and pushed him out of the way, and he went flying, and Kayla got hit with the car, and uh, she is fine. I, it, I, it's unbelievable how fast that car was going, but God protected her. She has no broken bones. I'm sure she's sore and bruised today. But that could have been so much worse if it hadn't been for God's grace. So we just praise God. So another piece of that story is if you have young children and you park across the street, we've asked Suffolk County for a crosswalk. We've asked the police to, to uh, help, help with those transitions. Uh, we're probably going to make some changes out there. But um, until then, we've got to make sure that everybody's safe. So uh, we just praise God for protecting them. The ambulance took them away and got them x-rays and all of that. But how exciting is that, that God just, I mean, we, that could have been infinitely worse. So praise God for that. Hey, we want to finish our sermon series today, Opportunity. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. If you need a Bible, they're there at your seats. If you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible home with you. But page 565 there at the Bible, at, at, at the seat. Bible there at your seats. And we want to uh, finish this series on opportunity. A couple of weeks ago, we talked primarily to uh, young people uh, three weeks ago. And then last two weeks ago, we talked to primarily single people. And last week, we talked to married people. 
We're going to talk to everybody sort of today, uh, maybe the older ones may, may need to pay a little more attention to this than younger ones, but it'll, all of these messages, even though they may have been geared toward a specific group of people, all of these messages, the, the teaching transcends all of those lines and all of these principles apply to everybody, although you know how some things apply to you a little differently in segments of your life or certain stages of your life. So this whole series has been geared around specific opportunities that we have to glorify God in our life by making a right decision that maybe, maybe we don't think about very often. And today's lesson is one of those that may just escape us for just a moment. We're talking about investment opportunities, and honestly, it has nothing to do with your money. So take a deep breath, right? <laughs> And, and, and listen carefully as we press into the subject. I want to start off by telling you about the man who taught me more about the Bible than anybody else probably on the planet. I learned more from this man who recently went to be with the Lord on May 2nd, 2019. I announced it the next weekend at church because this guy means so much to me personally, as a mentor, as someone who who just spent some time with me and all of that, it's Warren Wearsby. I should have put his middle initial up there. I said that last night. I should have corrected the slide. His middle initial is W, so it's Warren W. Wearsby. Those are just cool initials, aren't they? WWW. I mean, even way before the World Wide Web, he had the initials. But Warren Wearsby is, is, you may not know who it is, but if you've read much Christian, many Christian books, he's written a couple of hundred Christian books, I think in excess of 200 uh, books, commentary series. This guy used to be the pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, which is uh, an iconic American church. He's, he's, he, he's been the pa uh, pastor of pastors. That's kind of his, his ministry at the end of his life. But I got seated at his table when I first started the ministry, like my first pastor's conference Kim and I went to. Uh, we got seated somehow miraculously at his table and got connected with Warren Wearsby of all people and his wife, Betty. Uh, we had a conflict in our church. We had this monumental thing happen in our church when we first started. Every church has stuff go on from time to time. We're full of imperfect people, and so that just happens. And as a young pastor, I didn't know what to do with it. And I had the phone number of this guy that was like my hero in the faith that other than lunch, I had never really talked to. And so I thought, you know, I, I don't even know if I'm going to get through to him. I'm sure he's got secretaries and all of that. And I, I called this number and the number he gave me was his home telephone number. And Betty answers, Mrs. Wearsby, I shouldn't call her Betty. Mrs. Wearsby answers and she said, Warren, which is something I never kind of expected. I mean, you got this incredible man of God, and she's, you know, yelling across the house. And, and I don't know what he was doing. He's probably writing. That's, that's what he did most of the time. He was probably writing, and he put down whatever he was doing and said, hello, Martin, and took my call. I've tried to call much less people than Warren Wearsby and can't get him on the phone, so... I was a little bit taken back by that. I thought there would be a message. Maybe he would call me back. I mean, this is a busy guy. Even in his late, maybe mid-70s, early 70s, I suppose, at that time. And, and, and he came to the phone. And he listened to me for a long time. We had a conversation. It's like nothing else on the planet mattered to the guy. He was engaging with questions and seeking to understand. And then... He started to pour into my life with this is what the word of God says you need to do. And he just brought out truths of scripture in that particular situation and spoke into my life in such an incredible way and, and gave me a solution that was, I don't know of another word, iconic. It was a solution that I hadn't even considered, but it was so clear after I had a guy that had been a pastor for decades and decades and decades. This is what you need to do. And then he prayed for me. And he prayed for me the way that I needed to be prayed for. 
that wasn't our last conversation, and we exchanged many letters, and I sent him a thank you note. And from time to time, especially after that particular phone call, I would get a box of books, because he's right written several hundred books, and there would be books that he loves to give to young pastors, and they would have little notes in them, and his signature, and a, I don't know if there was a date or not, and long letters would accompany these books, and I still have some of those letters. But he made himself available. His, 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 his advice was invaluable to me. He made a tremendous difference to me. As busy as he was, he took so much time. He's gone now. He's in heaven. God needed him for something else. He lived a fantastic life. But his influence lives on. His influence is felt not just by me. I was having a dinner with a pastor and his wife in Chicago years ago, and, and we got on the conversation of Warren Wiersbe, and, he said, and we just looked at each other and went, he's done that for you too? I, I guess he does this for many pastors. We come to find out. That's what he considers his, his ministry in the last years of his life. He, if a pastor called, he dropped everything and just poured into that man's life and then didn't lose touch with him. Actually maintained those relationships on a very, very personal level. His influence lives on in churches all across America and, 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 and has influenced this church in powerful ways. Every single one of you, all of you, even you listening online, all of you have the exact same opportunity that Warren Wiersbe had. All of you have the opportunity to pour into someone else's life, but if you're not incredibly careful, you will miss that opportunity. And I don't want you to miss that opportunity. I mean, you have, by opportunity, I mean you have the opportunity to leverage your experience, your life experiences. You have the opportunity to leverage every single part of your life in such a way that will speak into the lives and influence the next generation, those coming alongside of you. If you're younger, you need to lean into this this morning because you need to grab hold of some of that advice that someone's pouring into you, some of those stories that you may gloss over or roll your eyes, we're hearing it again. But there is incredible truth and power and influence in those stories if we take those principles especially when we're young and listen to those stories, we can avoid potholes, we can avoid catastrophes in our life because we don't have to repeat some of the mistakes that those people have made. And they're willing to share those details with us. And we're, we're talking about this way beyond our families. It's not about we're supposed to pour into our families. It's easy to pour into our children but I want to talk to you today about extending that beyond who you're supposed to reach out to, your family, who it's natural for us to reach out to. You see, all of you have a treasure chest full of life experiences that, listen to this, will die right along with you unless you become intentional about sharing those in your life. We talk a lot about intentional living at South Bay Bible Church, and that's intentional. <laughs> because if we don't get intentional, we'll wake up one day and life will have passed us by. We'll have missed opportunities. We have to be intentional in all the disciplines of life. And this is one of those. I, I want to just share with you some of the life experiences that you may think you don't have, you couldn't share about. Look, some of you are married, right? And you're married, put these right here. Here's, here's our married for those folks on this side of the room, right? And we're married and you may go, Pastor, I, I, I don't have anything to share with, with married folks. I, 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 you should see my marriage. Are you kidding me? Like nobody wants my advice. They know me. People that know me are like, yeah, don't tell me about marriage. I don't want to live that way. Can I just share with you, you probably have more to share than I do. You probably have more because of your experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, 
You, you, you have things to share to people that are struggling in the very same way with their marriage. You go, yeah, but I used to be married. We're not married anymore, so obviously I can't share. Are you kidding me? You've probably overcome things that nobody ever thought about before. You, you've probably overcome things and experienced things that, that, that people that are in the next stage of life behind you they're probably going through some of those same things. And you know how hindsight is always 2020. You have analyzed and thought about the mistakes you've made, and you can pass that information along to another couple that their marriage won't blow up. But pastor, I'm in my second marriage or my third marriage or wherever I've landed. You still have some hindsight to share. You still have some experiences to share, especially if maybe one has fallen. Maybe one, maybe, maybe, maybe you've lost your husband. You've lost your wife. And you have, especially, you have sh things to share with someone who's lost. We, we've just went through that in the church with a new widow. And ladies are gathering around her to encourage her, bless her, and her group especially, to encourage her and take her through that season of life that she's never experienced before. You have things to share in your life. And whether it's good or bad, indifferent, you have things that you can pour into other people's life. Some of you are leaders. You, 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 you've led all kinds of things from, from work assignments, as simple as work assignments, to maybe a ministry you've led, and, and, and South Bay Bible Church, we're, we're all about this, that everything needs to multiply. So leaders in ministries, deacons, I, I want you to be working yourself out of a job. I, I try to work myself out of my job every day and give little pieces of what I do away because we're equippers. God has called us to equip people. And if you're in a leadership role, you have experience to share. You have things that you need to pass on. You have life experiences to pour into someone else. You say, but, but my leadership was a disaster. Like I look back and I got like nobody following me. Listen, everybody leads something if it's just your own life. If it's just something at work. Everybody leads something. We have things we can share with leadership. How about your... Gold. <laughs> I'm not talking about giving all your gold away. I, I'm, I'm talking today about some of you have made money. Some of you have lost a lot of money. <laughs> you, you, you get in, in, in front of someone who's, who's behind you and you talk to them about money and you realize how little they know and how much you know whether you have a bunch of it or not. Because you've lived through those experiences. And you can warn them, look, if you're young, you need to start saving. You need to, I didn't save, but I know now I should have been saving. And it just takes a little bit and it compounds and it's unbelievable. And you get that working for you and, and you can pour out those experiences. And listen, I wasn't maybe, you, this is your experience, I wasn't such a giver growing up, but I've learned now that, that, that giving is so important because it keeps your stuff from having you, and you can pour out those life examples over and over and over. Maybe God wants you to help with tangible money, but it's probably more about the lessons you've learned and applied. How about credit card debt? How many of us get years into life and we look back and we go, we're just working to make Visa's next building glamorous, and it's robbing me of my life. And we can take those lessons and pass them on. And they don't have to live under all of that debt and all of those experiences. How many of you have faith issues to deal with, right? Maybe you've come along. Everybody has some type of spiritual experience in their life. Everybody has some sort of, maybe they question faith. Maybe there's something in their life that was a real struggle in here. We talked to somebody this week that's, struggling so hard with something that God said in His Word. And you've been through that. 
and you come alongside of those people and you open this word up and you get really transparent with them and you invest in their life and maybe for a season of their life, you walk this out in front of them because it was tough for you and it's tough for them. But you're on the other side and you can kind of guide them through that process. Some of us have, have skeletons in our closet, don't we? We have skeletons in our closet, things we don't want anybody to know. Are you kidding me, Pastor? We're supposed to dredge all that stuff up. And I just tell you some of the worst experiences of my life that I would much rather forget. God has used in counseling. God has used in ministry. God has used one-on-one -on -one or with a small group of people to, to help people jumpstart their recovery, their faith journey, their whatever, to get out of the mess that they're in, in because of something dumb I've done in my life. I'm like the poster child for this. I think that's why God called me to be a pastor. I blew up another pastor's car. That's a skeleton I wanted to keep buried for a really long time. Forever. But God has used that to say, hey, don't let bitterness build up. Don't let resentment, don't let the anger get the best of you. You need to process those and we can take what the Satan meant for evil and God can use it for good, even our ugliest stuff. Some of us have skeletons to deal with in our life. Hey, hey, listen, some of you have been really good parents. And your parenting advice you can pour into somebody. Some of you have been really bad parents, and guess what? You have parenting advice that you can pour into somebody. Because you know how not to do it. You had struggles maybe with your children that other people are going through with their children and yours are in college or beyond and now you can share those bronze moments, can't you? Some new families think they can get all the information they need for raising their children off of Google. But let me just tell you, you can't. <laughs> all right, we're just going to go on with that. Here we go. Some of you have built things. Incredible things, right? You've built lives. You've built um, uh, uh, buildings. You, you, you've, you've built families back together that were destroyed. You've, you've been through things that you can pour into and bless and encourage other people with. I don't even know if this is legal in New York, but we're calling it a letter opener. <laughs> Some of you know what this is from Israel, actually. I got it in Israel for my son who's here today. I stole it out of his room without permission. So, <laughs> But some of you have been through conflict, right? And this sword represents, this little dagger represents conflict. And you've been through conflict. And you're on the other side of conflict now. And you know how to get out of it and how to deal with it and how to process it. And God has taught you so much. You didn't always get it right. But now you can speak into somebody and help them through a, a massive conflict so that their relationship doesn't blow up with their whoever that happens to be. And you can be a huge blessing in their life and pass those experiences on to somebody that's coming on behind you. And some of you, some of you have wore one of these I was thinking about putting this on and coming in out and preaching in it today, but you know these robes don't cover a whole lot. I might turn around and Jim gets flashed or something, right? That wouldn't be good. He's my prayer partner. <laughs> but you know what? You get the diagnosis. And you get on the other side of whatever that was. And you have a tremendous amount to share with somebody, don't you? They get a new diagnosis. My grandmother had Alzheimer's for 24 years, diagnosed at the age of 58. I found out this week or the age she was diagnosed. And, 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 and the caregiver, maybe you're a caregiver in that situation, never walked that road. My aunt took care of my grandmother in her house till the day she died. Isn't that incredible? I just give so much credit, but my aunt could speak into somebody's life who's doing some caregiving more than anybody, I don't know anybody that's, that, that, that poured out care to that magnitude. I'm sure there's some, but 
But if somebody needed some help in that area, you know what I would do? I would get them in touch with my Aunt Crystal. And she would share with them because that's the kind of lady she is. She, she believes in this message that I'm sharing today. Some of you have all kinds of things that you can share. Our lives are filled with all kinds of treasures that God would have us not keep to ourselves, but share with other people. You've experienced highs and lows in every single one of these things. You've faced sickness, faith, church, disappointment, aging parents, transfers, fears, miscarriages, and fertility issues. And there's people coming along behind you that are entering these phases of life or, or are going to be in these phases of life. And God doesn't want to waste any of the pain that's, been, that, that's happened in our life. You have acquired valuable wisdom, experience, and perspectives. And from all of those, we can be a blessing to other people. You can be a blessing to other people. So what are you going to do with all of this? What are you going to do with all of this? Die with it? Most people do. Honestly, most people do just die with all of their treasure. It gets buried with them because they never took the time to pass along the lessons that they've learned to those who were coming behind them. Let me share with you this. The value of a life is always, always, always determined by how much of it was given away. Well, this is true of all of you. If you're a Christian, if you're a Jesus follower, right? If you're not a Jesus follower, you don't have to do this, but you should do this. You don't have to. But if you're a Jesus follower, you say Jesus is my Lord and my God, then there's a divine mandate attached to everything you've ever gone through, everything you have of value, including your life experiences. Everything. If you've been here for a while, or if you grew up in the church, if you've been at South Bay for uh, uh, more than a year, you, you may remember the, Jesus' parable of the talents. Anybody familiar with the parable of the talents? We're going to talk about that for a few minutes this morning. It's in Matthew chapter 25. But Jesus often taught his, the people around him lessons about heaven or lessons about life. And he would start those parables usually with, the kingdom of heaven is like. <laughs> because he was trying to get us to have a heavenly mindset, which, by the way, if you haven't figured it out already, is pretty much the opposite of everything we think is right in the world. It's pretty much the opposite of what is popular and cultural out there today. If you just do pretty much the opposite, you'll usually be in line with the kingdom of heaven is like. It seems so foreign to us. And so Jesus would draw these everyday lessons and say, the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like, and then launch into this eye-opening revelation of information and truth that would boggle our minds. So he, he does that with this parable of the talents. This master has three servants. He has three slaves, if you will, or servants. And, and he brings them in and he gives them three different amounts of money. He's going to take this big trip. He's going on this world cruise. He's flying to Australia. Wherever he's doing in the first century, he's going to take this long journey and he's entrusting his property while he's gone to his servants. He's got three of them, and he gives them different amounts of money, different bags of gold, depending on their ability. So one's a really fantastic manager. He's been tried and true a few times, and so he's going to give him five bags of money. The Bible calls them talents. It could be real estate. It could be whatever the asset is to take care of, but we're going to say bags of gold because that's what we can identify with today. So he gives the first one five bags of money because he's been a good manager. The second one comes in and maybe he's new or whatever, but he gives him two bags of money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to entrust you with two bags. I want you to get a good return with this. And the third one comes in. He's brand new. He's just green behind the ears. He's young. He gives him one bag of money. Let's, let's see how you do with this, friend. Let's see how you do with it. And so he leaves on his journey. The expectation was, while I'm away, you take this, you invest this, 
I'm entrusting you with these resources. And, and when I come back, we'll see how you, you do. I want you to invest it, and I want you to get a good return on the money that I'm entrusting you with. So most of the time in this story, the, ir the irresponsible servant, the one who got one bag of gold, he didn't do so well, but this servant usually gets all of the air in the room. He usually gets all of the attention in the story, don't he? I preached that sermon many times, and we focus in, don't be like that irresponsible servant, and we launch in this whole, whole, whole sermon about that. But today I want to do something different. I want to focus in, I want to zero in on the two servants that did the right thing. Let's, let's see how they handled their money, the, 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 the master's money. Jesus launches in and he says this, after a long time, a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them, to find out how they did with what he, they, he, he had given them. How, how did the investment turn out? Come on in and tell me. The man who had received five talents, five bags of gold, brought the another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, he has other servants with him now, and, and they're wheeling in the bags of gold and wheelbarrows, and, and he's so excited. Master, I couldn't wait for you to get back here so I could show you what I've accomplished for you. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The same thing with a guy with two bags. He returned and he said, Master, I've gained two more bags of gold with what you've given me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. Listen, your experiences are like bags of gold. God has given them to you. Whether they're good or bad experiences, whatever decision you made, whether you did the right thing or the wrong thing, you've learned something. And it's a bag of gold. And you have an opportunity to invest in others. You have a responsibility to get a good return for God in those experiences. So don't bury it. Don't allow it to be buried with you. And in this context, you can clearly understand the master's response to the one who took his treasure, the master's treasure, and buried it in the ground. He said, you wicked lazy servant. My translation to that is, are you freaking kidding me? What is wrong with you? You had an opportunity and you threw it away. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? I could have buried it in the ground and never told you about it. Listen, my life has been impacted by some people. When I started inventorying them, I, I just reminiscing and remembering Kim's life has been impacted by these people because I was the one coming along behind. Now I'm approaching that age and more and more people are coming behind me, right? We get to that point. Let me tell you about some of these folks. Michael Copeland, or to me, Mr. Copeland. Never called him Michael in school because he was my sixth grade teacher. This is the teacher I told you I had such an anger problem. I've told you this before that I picked up a desk and threw it across the room. Well, it was Mr. Copeland who processed that with me. In today's property, in today's school system, they'd probably just kick me out. They probably should have expelled me for that, but that's not what Mr. Copeland did. Mr. Copeland sent me out of the room probably to give himself a little bit of time to calm down. And then he came out after what seemed like a small eternity, to me anyway, and he wrapped his arm around me and he corrected me. And then he, he loved me and he prayed for me. And he began to teach me how to deal with anger. When I see red, what should we do? And he began to show me in a very tangible way how to process that. I got counseling for that later, but that's where it began. 
He was one of the greatest teachers I ever had. Warren Wiersbe, I've already told you about Warren Wiersbe, but one of those stories in the very early days, there was a lot of idle talk in the church, a lot of loose talk. And I, I don't know if you've read the proverb or not, but loose talk destroys people. Loose talk destroys relationships, and a church is full of relationships. And if you destroy some of those relationships, you're destroying the church of God. And, and that's one of the things I called him about, and his insight was brilliant because I, I couldn't get angry and just go rebuking everybody or deal with it that way, but I did have to teach them what loose talk was because they didn't even get it. So if that's something you struggle with, get help because don't destroy or come against the work of God. That's a dangerous place to be in. God loves his church. It's the means that by which men are redeemed because the church has the responsibility to point people to the cross and you don't want to impact that negatively. And loose talk and all of the backbiting and garbage in a church destroys the church. And man, he had wisdom through that. He had been through that so many times. And he was able to take me through a plan and get me to the other side. And I visited that church that we started and had that problem in. And it's still going. New pastors, several pastors later. But it's still there. We posted some pictures on Facebook if you want to check those out. We were able to go in and look around. The next two have to come up together. And it's four people. We went through one of the, I'm sorry, not one of. It was the darkest moment in our marriage. I've told you this before. We were this close to divorce. I had the divorce attorney on the phone more than once. At this point in my life, I had this law firm on retainer. I just picked them up and called them. And they always took my call because they were paid to do that. And I say, oh, hold on one second. Let me call you back. Because God didn't want us to divorce. But he brought us around Mark and Cindy Hager, who had been friends of ours for quite a while. And can I just tell you something? Both of Mark and Cindy have been divorced in their life. Do they have anything to share with us? Of course they did. They repented of all of that nonsense that led to their divorce. And now they're following Christ. He's one of the best biblical counselors. He taught me biblical counseling. And he and Cindy got together with Phil and Regina Rice, who helped us start that first church. And they poured their lives into us, not for a day, not for an hour. They didn't just pray with us. They walked with us for an entire season of our marriage to get our marriage back to glorifying God and keep us to marry, married. My children, and my wife, and I, and my granddaughter owe our family, <laughs> owe our lives our relationships by God's grace because all of them follow Jesus to the, those four people who poured into us in such a supernatural way. We needed it. And they didn't say, I'm so glad they didn't say, yeah, I've been divorced. I really can't help you with your marriage. I, I'm too busy. Can I tell you about Phil Rice? He runs one of the biggest companies in Fort Myers, Florida. A huge company. He employed a couple of hundred people. Do you know what his schedule is like? But a couple of times a week, he would meet with Kim and I, with Regina, his wife. A couple of times a week, he would meet with me alone. He carved out so much time. I could never repay those four people for what they did for me. Nelson Searcy was a church coach. I don't know if you know this or not, but Maybe you've never thought of it. You're sitting in tangible chairs and all of that, but church work is largely intangible. I mean, I, we're teaching spiritual lessons, and you've got to try to put them on and wrap your mind around them. And, and, and you know, we're praying to a, an invisible God who, honestly, that's the, the natural realm, but God is more visible than anything else on the planet. I mean, if you really get honest with it, you see him in absolutely everything. So that's a ridiculous statement, but even in that... Prayer is largely intangible as long as we feel. And Nelson Searcy came alongside of me and he made ministry something we could grab hold of. And much of what we do in the church today is a result of his impact in our, you know those little communication cards that we use all the time? We couldn't do ministry hardly without them. They help us so much. They came from his church. He's got three churches in Manhattan. 
one in Boca Raton, Florida, and, and some other cities. An incredible man of God who, who God is just blessed with information to help churches grow and do what God wants them to do. And my current church coach, what a man of God. Tom Rayner is a, it, it, is, it used to be CEO of Lifeway, which is a huge Christian publishing house for the Southern Baptist Church. He's a man of God who now runs churchanswers.com and, and pastors can go in there, deacons can go in there, people can go in there and get answers to really complicated by situations. And, and, and wow, it's just an incredible organization. And he takes 25 men a, 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 at a time. And I happen to be one of those 25 men and he pours into us at least three times a month. If I have a, a big concern, I can call him anytime I need him. And, and he's there and he's helped us with so many things here at South Bay. But what an incredible man of God he's become in my life. I'm so glad these people didn't say, I don't know anything. I can't help you. I'm so glad these people didn't say, I, I, I just don't have anything to help, helpful to, to share. Because they did. They, they usually spoke to me out of something bad that happened in their life. And Warren Wiersbe, you'd think, well, he's been like perfect all of his life. I mean, he's like the man. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, Billy Graham, Warren Wiersbe. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible guys. The stories he would share with me were so eye-opening because he went through that and lived through that at Moody Church and all these other places. I'm so glad these men didn't say, you know, Martin, I'm just too busy. I just don't have time. All of them have busier schedules than I do, and they didn't say that. Can I just speak into that last one just real quickly? If you're too busy to help somebody through your life experiences, can I just share with you, you're way busier than God ever intended you to be. For some of you, do you know who said that? <laughs> Do you know who said that statement? Warren Wiersbe. <laughs> it's in one of his books. For some of you, this is an opportunity. This is your opportunity to redeem or to, 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 um, to redeem a past failure. To take that failure and see something good come out of it for someone else. Besides, can I just be really brutally honest with you? Your kids are tired of hearing those stories anyway. Your kids are tired of hearing them and, and your grandkids are probably not at a point in their life where they can appreciate them. And if nothing else happens, if nothing else happens, you'll at least have a few more people at your funeral. I mean, come on. There's a no win, no lose situation here. There's no downside. Get involved. My life isn't all that special and I don't know anything. That's a, probably the most common objection. But you have no idea how much you know until you talk to someone at the stage of life behind you. And it's like, wow, I do know a lot more than I thought I knew. And you're able to pour into their lives on whatever they're going through or about to go through or you see something that they don't see because you've been there. You'll know more than you think. Just start having that conversation and lean into that. My point isn't that all of you need to come volunteer at the church, but if you do, we have things for everybody. I'm, I'm telling you, you, you think churches aren't that busy, but Joanne, what do you think back there? <laughs> there is lots to do all the time. Someone either did this for you or someone didn't do this for you. Someone did it for you, your life, if you look back and you probably have some, some people there you could put to the list and tell their story. If they did this to you, they made your life so much richer. And, and if someone didn't do this for you, your life could have been so much richer and more prosperous as a result. So listen, come on. It's your turn. It's your turn. What are you going to do with all this stuff? Forget about the parrot, right? I left him in there because it, it's cool, but what are you going to do with all this stuff? Are you going to bury it? Are you going to let it be buried with you? Are, 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 because 
you don't think you have anything to offer or you're just simply too absorbed in your own life to care about someone else, you can hang on to all of this because after all, it's yours to hang on to. But if you hang on to it, it won't be worth anything when you're gone. Nothing. Because it'll be gone right along with you. So don't bury it. Don't let it be buried with you. Share it. Give it away. Invest in others. And leverage it for the sake of those coming along behind you. Let's pray. God, we praise you for this lesson today, the parable of the talents. Thank you, Jesus. The, the parable of the talent has so one truth, but so many applications. And Lord, we just drew one of those applications out to not allow anything we go through to be wasted. That, Lord, you can work good out of every single thing we've gone through, whether we did the right thing or we did the wrong thing, whether we became addicted or whether we avoided that temptation altogether, whether we had a great marriage or a bad marriage, whether, Lord, there's people coming alongside of us and coming up behind us that are going to go through many of the same things. God, I pray that we would see that, that you would open our eyes to it in the name of Jesus and that, God, you would, you would give us those opportunities to glorify and honor you in Jesus' name. Help us use the experiences we have to be a blessing, just like Warren Wiersbe was to me, Michael Copeland, the Hagers, the, the Rices, and, and Lord, my church coaches. Let us be that blessing to the next generation. And Lord, if we are that next generation, help us to to lean into the life experiences of those people, not roll our eyes, not, not gloss over what they did, but, but grab hold of that because we don't have to repeat their dumb mistakes. And Lord, we praise you for that wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.